Thank you everyone for coming tonight. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people whose land I stand on. I'd also acknowledge the Coverage Barta people whose land I'm going to talk about tonight. They're a subset of Darug and the Gandagara people. So without further ado, let's get into it. So East Leppington, you might have heard of all the growth centres in and around the Sydney, the green belts that have been turned into residential developments. East Lappington is one of them, and as you can see from the figure in the top right, it's in Sydney's southwest. It's one of the southwest growth centres. The blue line in the main figure denotes the outline of the, the land grant that has been awarded and rezoned residential. And the Stockland are, have bought all of that land and they're actually going to undertake residential development across it. Now, Stockland I work a lot with, and they should be acknowledged as well for fundamentally funding this research that we have undertaken because the work we've done out there goes well past what you would normally undertake in commercial archaeology and can be classified entirely as academic research. The landscape is very very interesting because before we went into it we undertook some GIS analysis and we started having a little look at what existed out there and at a basic level you have a series of low hills with a large creek, it's called a fourth water watercourse, and that means that the water flows up and down this creek on a very regular basis, joined by a smaller second water watercourse that has wetland zones in and around its far upper reaches, a big wetland zone where the two join together. But most interestingly are these hills, and these, we have two hills within the study area itself, within this Leppington area. Outside of it, there's a further two. There's one to the south and one to the north. And these hills are instrumental in the historic landscape, which I won't talk about much tonight, but also particularly, I believe, the Aboriginal landscape. This is the earliest parish map. And as you'll see, this land was allocated to a chap called William Cordo in 1812. He lived out here for quite a long time. He was given 700 acres as a grant. And his land grant it remains the boundary of the land today that Stockland have bought. Now he built what's known as Leppington House on one of the four hills that exist in this area. This is the second highest hill, and the highest hill is just to the south of it. So we have the two highest hills in the local area. These hills are today referred to as the scenic hills. They're protected under the LEP, and development in and around this area isn't allowed to impinge on the ridge line that covers these hills. In fact, when people build houses, when you stand at a low level, you're not allowed to build a house that elevates itself above the ridge line, And that's enshrined within the development principles for this suburb. Now, when you go and stand on top of those hills, this is the view from the land that Cordo built his house on, Leppington House. As you can see, when you stand on this hill, you can see the whole CBD. That's the Harbour Bridge. That's the North Shore CBD. That's the Parramatta CBD. When you turn around the other way, and this is from the second hill, they are the Blue Mountains. This is the landscape in the foreground that covers the East Leppington Growth Centre currently. And the main band of trees in the middle ground runs up and down that big creek. The second small band of trees runs up and down the smaller creek. Now, when we came into this landscape, we didn't know a lot about what Aboriginal people had undertaken at all here. We had a little bit of data, and we used that data to try and create a baseline understanding of what had happened out here. And so when we started doing some background studies, and I'm going to run you quickly through the background studies that we undertook, because it provides a context for what we did later. So we did a lot of GIS modelling, we looked at landscape and disturbance, and we tried to develop a theoretical model for the Aboriginal use of this place. We then did archaeological test excavation across the landscape to try and work out what was in this landscape and what we needed to do. So one of the first bits of data we look at is the OEH, the, the Office of Environment Heritage's Ames Register. That's the statutory register on which all Aboriginal sites are placed. And as you can see, across the East Lappington Growth Centre, I think there was about 60 to 70 registered sites. They're the little red triangles. And most of those sites related to single stone artefacts. The record here, we could describe as very, very messy. It related fundamentally to locations that were quite highly disturbed by service corridors, gas mains, and service installations that went across the land. It didn't really tell us an awful lot about what Aboriginal people were doing, other than there was locations with stone objects in here. When we cross-correlated that with the disturbance mapping, we started to get an idea of where soils could be across this landscape that would tell us more about Aboriginal occupation. But at this point, we had no idea this area contained anything special. So what I wanted to do was try and undertake some testing across the landscape. So basically, we came and we 
undertook archaeological testing under what's called the code of practice, and that allows us to place small 50 by 50 centimeter trenches across the landscape. I developed a predictive model of where we might find archaeology, and I believe we excavated around 530 test units. The colours that are shown on this figure define the locations where we have different soil landscapes. So to have a study area where we have different soil landscapes is very unique as well. And in this area, we had three different types of soil landscape. We only expected to really find two. The red dots were black town soil, which is a colluvial soil, it's a degrading soil. People have always farmed it because you can grow crops on it, but it's quite poor. And archaeologically, it contains archaeological sites and deposits but it doesn't really contain stratigraphy. It's often messed around, it's quite shallow, and it's often ploughed. Secondly, we had the Ludnum soil landscape, which related to those hills. So those big hills that I showed you in the GIS plan on the topographic, also the parish map, were lo located over a Ludnum soil. So different geomorphological process formed at different times, a degrading soil landscape. Pretty much no archeology span had ever been done on those soils. So we didn't know what we would find. Now I had hoped that when we excavated along Bonds Creek, the big watercourse, we would find alluvial soils. Alluvial soils are waterborne soils. They're soils that move with water and they're deposited and they then cover any archeology. span So when you get a flood, water floods in and it brings in sediment, the waters go down and it covers and caps any archeology. span It's one of the kind of holy grails for archeologists <coughs> is finding alluvial soils because it means you can have stratified sites. So you can have a site of depth, say a meter, that's at an age of, say, 1,000 years old, half a metre, it might be 500 years old, 200 mil down, it might be 200 years old. You kind of get the idea. So we hoped we would find alluvial soils in and around this location. And as you can see from the little yellow dots and the orange dots, there were distinct locations, particularly around the creek junctions, and particularly connected with the flooding, the large wetland areas, where we had alluvial soils. So we were quite excited about this. Now, if you look at predictive Aboriginal archaeological models for the Cumberland Plain and where the archaeology on the Cumberland Plain has been undertaken over the last 20 to 30 years, most of it has been undertaken on these Blacktown soils. The Blacktown soils are quite extensive, and therefore most archaeology has not been able to focus, and archaeological research has not focused on alluvial floodplains associated with the Cumberland Plain. So this excavation was quite unique in the fact that we were going to access those floodplain resources and hopefully find archaeology in them. When we did testing, this is just a little table, and what it defines is the landform. So you have things like hilltops, ridges, slopes, flats and terraces, by the different, the three different soil types. The Blacktown South Creek, that's where you had one lying over the top of the other one. So you had an older Blacktown, and then South Creek flooding over the top of it and burying it. And when we undertake testing, we aim to test a variety of soil landscapes and a variety of landforms to look at where the archaeology is and where the archaeology isn't. We tried to develop, before we went out there, a kind of predictive model and an Aboriginal model of how Aboriginal people might have used this landscape. So I looked at all the different type of archaeology we had in the region and tried to work out what Aboriginal people were doing in different kinds of locations. I applied a bunch of different theoretical models to it. And what I suggested, this is at the time of testing, was there were a number of potential village locations or habitation locations where that were conducive, the landforms that were conducive for Aboriginal people doing lots of camping on combined with strategic hilltops that would be very, very good for having lookouts, so large view corridors. And when you looked at how the landforms fell out, the area adjacent to both of the creeks really lent itself to being able to hunt animals in, basically herd, say, larger herds of kangaroos or other types of macropods down the creek corridors and be able to kill them. And we therefore potentially expected the landforms, the flat landforms either side of the creek near to that potential hunting location to actually have the archaeology relating to Aboriginal use of this landscape. This model was designed so we could set up research questions for the testing. And the good thing about doing a model is it's hypothetical. And I'll tell you now, that was completely wrong. I set up a model, I tested it, and it was wrong. So we, can't, we, we changed it to another model. But the reason I want to put it in is that the things I'm saying tonight, and as we'll get into a bit of theory later, what I'm describing to you, it's still a hypothetical model. It can be tested, it can be improved, it, bits of it can be disputed, bits of it can be changed over time. And I always like to try and figure out what people are doing and work with the Aboriginal communities to try and figure out what people have done in the past. So this was just an early model that we proved just didn't work. So when we tested 533 units, 
we established some pretty rigorous and some quite new means of testing the landscape, looking at some archaeology and means of testing large landscapes that have come out of the UK to work out the best way of finding where the archaeology was. We found 519 stone artefacts, which isn't a great number, but what was key was we found a huge number of the test units didn't have any archaeology in them. So it showed us that Aboriginal people were working and using stone in very particular locations within this landscape. So the stone wasn't everywhere, it was really, really constrained. So we started looking at where the stone was across the wider landscape. Key as well was the fact we identified geochronified stratigraphical sequences. So the stone analyst, Beth White, who is one of Sydney's um, very, very renowned stone analysts, she identified through the statistical analysis of the material we've got out that we did in fact have stratified sequences going through the alluvium, which was really quite exciting. And as I say at the bottom, the theoretical model I developed was completely incorrect. Those locations I suggested were village locations, had absolutely no evidence of any kind whatsoever. I was happy to be disproved because it let me go on and try and create a new model. So what did we find? Ignoring the colours that relate to archaeological potential, which is a combination of a whole different bunch of factors, each of these little blobs that you can see on the screen contained dense archaeological signatures. The larger blobs were areas that had scatters of material over the surface in a more disturbed context. So ignore the kind of this large orange blob and this large green one, and this one here because that was a very disturbed zone. But if you note the small little blobs and the separation, distance between them. So for instance, these three orange ones, or the, the entire pamphlet set of little blobs around the creek confluence, and you'll notice that we have discrete zones with archaeology, and then I haven't coloured any area in between, and that's because there was no stone objects in that area. I'm not saying there was one, two, or five stone objects in that area. There was literally nothing in between the coloured zones. There was no evidence for hearths, no evidence for cooking, no evidence for stone artefacts. The soil stratigraphy, particularly around the creek confluence, was perfect. It wasn't disturbed, it was in really good condition and good integrity, so it had good archaeological potential. We just didn't find anything in those locations. So when we plot all these locations we find or found archaeology on a map, we end up with all these little discrete blobs, which was quite interesting, and I'm going to get into that in a second. At this point in time, we also undertook what's called hill slope shade analysis. And so we used the TIN, so the triangulated irregular network with all the contour lines. We asked the GIS guy, can you please provide me with a model that shows how much light energy falls on each part of the landscape. So it's quite easy for them to do, I understand if you know what you're doing. This little figure here, it shows you how much light energy falls onto this landscape in the middle of winter. I have ones that show midday, so I normally do midday, so I do midday in the middle of summer, midday in the middle of winter. In the middle of winter in this area, you have freezing fogs, we excavated twice, oh sorry, when we did open excavation, we excavated in the middle of winter, so I know what the freezing fogs are like. <laughs> really horrible. And so when you undertake this analysis, the dark zones are the coldest areas at midday in winter. And as you can see, there's some locations, particularly around the sunken creek corridors, that would be really, really quite cold. Now, Aboriginal people weren't daft. They used the landscape in a way that was favorable to them. They understood absolutely how everything worked. They knew the locations they could go to, would be nice and warm, how to stay sheltered, how to use their land and their country. And so in the middle of winter, you wouldn't find people camping down in and around this creek confluence because it's freezing. It really is. There's frosts on the ground and freezing fogs. However, in summer, when you do the same analysis in summer, those same locations that in winter that are freezing actually are quite nice. So when you have those 40, 40 plus days in Sydney, the creek confluence has a nice little breeze playing over it. In the shade, it might be 25 to 30 degrees. So the locations in summer that are good, or good for summer, are very different to the locations for winter. When you apply the archaeology, what we found out of that testing over the top of it, you'll note that a lot of these archaeological sites, the little lozenges, are located within those dark zones. There's a few that are located on areas that are brighter, but the majority, I think it's about 75 to 80 percent, are located in darker zones. So we recently started thinking, well, is this area being used during summer? And what implications does that have for other aspects of Aboriginal culture. So just remember that one of the theories I'm suggesting is that this place is used in summer and that comes into play a bit later. Okay, we're going to go into a bit of theory now, so you're going to have to bear with me. The theory I'm going to present was developed 
from a lot of my thinking. It's about to be published in the journal Historic Environment later this year, and I presented this at an ECOMOS conference last year, so hopefully you can follow it. Okay, so at the base level, archaeological theoretical interpretations aim to take raw data and present it in a meaningful way that examines the past to provide a context for who we are, what we were doing, and where we were doing it. Interpretations frequently relate to archaeological objects, to the human agents who created the objects, to the activities associated with the objects. As such, archaeological theoretical application, interpretation, and consequential outcomes have a multitude of approaches that may be contingent on the context and objectives of the investigating agent. Given this, interpretation can be tempered by factors such as race, religion, social upbringing, education, political and academic contexts. Over the last 50 years, archaeological frameworks have moved through a number of the schools of thoughts, processual, post-processual, new types of archaeology, etc., etc. We've also included a whole bunch of other social sciences, geography, physical geography, philosophy, again, etc., etc. The connections between interpretations and the raw data have to present a plausible reasoning and underpin the reading of the data that we, the archaeologists, have collected. Recent investigations into the application of Western archaeological theory to Aboriginal culture, especially the physical culture of Aboriginal archaeology, have highlighted a number of problems. For example, difficulties associated with the application of theory arise from a compression of archaeological data into a two-dimensional plane, because temporal and spatial aspects of that data then become missing from the cultural presence and the frameworks we then interpret. So for instance, that AIMS data, or the little blobs on the map, they're just blobs on the map. They have no information about the spatial relationships of the blobs or when the blobs were created. So one stone artifact could have been created yesterday, theoretically 200 years ago, and another one could have been 10,000 years ago. But you can't tell that from just looking at some blobs on a map. And I believe that's a real problem in how we interpret these places. Whilst creating a convenient organizing tool for Aboriginal culture, the blanket application of archaeological interpretation on the two-dimensional complaint can deny an understanding and appropriate interpretation of the complexity of the Aboriginal culture. Aspects of interpretation can be further confused through the complexities of non-Aboriginal language and cultures with the subjection of Aboriginal culture to definitions of English word. We have great complexities around apparently simple words such as site, place, space or time. The eventual application of these to the real world situations can be both confusing for archaeologists and the Aboriginal communities. So when we're students of archaeology, we normally learn how to investigate objects and sites, and we don't normally apply a great deal of interpretation to these tangible things. We're looking to quantify them. However, when the Aboriginal people look at these things, they often haven't had the same Western education we have. So they take these objects to be part of themselves, to be part of their country and part of their spiritual being. They kind of approach it from an entirely different perspective. And I believe the key is trying to gel the science, the, the quantification, versus this intangible evidence, the notion of how Aboriginal people approach and want to analyse their material to culture from the top. This means that the Aboriginal community see their ancestry as a living archaeology. They see these places as reflecting memory and place and country. Generally, Aboriginal people do not view archaeological objects as things to be measured and studied. They view them as a direct connection to their ancestral past. This has been reiterated to me again and again from my studies and investigations around this country. So a key interpretive difference in the framework exists between the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal people. And it may lie in the traditional owners' views of Aboriginal objects and material culture as a constituent of practice and tradition. They do not hold significance, value or meaning without an appropriate social context. The divergence in approach and understanding of Aboriginal culture between a non-Aboriginal practitioner and an Aboriginal person highlights the gap between quantitative recording and qualitative understanding between fact and value, objective knowledge and subjective knowledge. And so what I've tried to do is develop a bit of a framework and a theoretical model to try and bridge the gaps between those two aspects of data. What I've proposed are three kind of layers of interpretation. We could call them tiers, layers, I'm trying to move from an absolute paradigm of archaeological data at the bottom through an inferred network of archaeological interpretation, that's the second tier, into a third tier with interpretive traditions. At any point in an interpretive framework, or this in tiered mechanism, you can move up and down between the three tiers of the framework. You can consider the basic data points, place it within an archaeological network, and you can then try and interpret it 
in a way that takes that data and places theories around it, such as that model that I started off by saying, you know, hey, perhaps this landscape was used for hunting. Perhaps this landscape was where they manufactured the tools to let them go hunting. That was interpreted traditions. I proved it wasn't right, and so I go back and develop a new model. The first tier here is the primary data, and it comprises of descriptions relating to the immutable or measurable information. For instance, there is a creek adjacent to a flat. The vegetation community is Cumberland Plain woodland. There is a stone object. This is made from silcrete. There is a back blade in this area that's 12 millimetres long. They're, they're facts, they're things we can measure and quantify. Saying it's a back blade of 12 millimetres in length doesn't tell us anything about how original people made, used, or how they valued that object. Why is it in this location? Okay, so the second tier, the inferred network, this takes the baseline data and places it in a framework a network, or a network. And often, as archaeologists in this country, we consider three themes, so society, demography, and economy. It can be considered a hermeneutics approach, and you can link things and objects with local cultural codes and practices. You create links between items and people, events, places, and landscapes. You create things within these landscapes. Things are dependent on other things. However, when you create a network, it still doesn't have any humans within it. The humans interact, that, interact with that network. But if you take the human out, all of a sudden the objects cease to be. They cease to function. They become static, and the network basically falls apart. So what I'm trying to do is really push interpretation within this third tier. And the third tier relates to what Ian Hodder, who's a very famous archaeologist from the UK, refers of entanglement. The third tier of entanglement is based on interpretation and extra extrapolation of the data from the first two, two tiers. The third tier takes the networks and the data and enriches it through Aboriginal culture that do not have a physical presence, such as ceremony and traditions, law, stories, people, kinship, things like that. The third tier provides an understanding of the importance of a stone object. It may reveal the complexities that a simple object may con conceal. It has the potential to reveal hitherto unhidden values and meanings. For example, engagement with an Aboriginal male could elicit statements such as, this was manufactured by my ancestor, through to, this object was used in a male initiation ceremony, which occurred in this place at this point in time. So the enrichment that they can provide takes that simple object and provides complete cultural context around it. It creates a value. It creates a reason for wanting to study and conserve or manage that object appropriately. The third tier also considers aspects of phenomenology, memory, practice, traditions in landscape. And without going on to it too much, it starts to look at the human agents within the networks that control and create tier two aspects of economy, demography, and society. I've also tried in all of these ideas to look at what we would call the archaeology of absence. Now, I consider the archaeology of absence quite important. And the archaeology of absence is the blank spaces around the objects and the things. So when I showed you that plan at the beginning that showed the little blobs within the landscape, key to interpreting that plan was the fact that there was an absence of cultural material in between the blobs. The absence of cultural material between the blobs provides Aboriginal people with an understanding of the broader landscape. And it might provide insight into the places and the traditions that form an integral component of the lives and the being, and indeed the use of the landscape. The archaeology of absence, the archaeology of nothingness, provides meanings for those third tier frames. And I found a lovely quote from some academics, and they said, nothingness is not a state of absence of objects, but rather it affirms the existence of the unseen behind the empty spaces. So it's basically saying just because there isn't anything there, doesn't mean that that location wasn't part of a wider tradition. And it isn't that location without anything in it, the absence. Whilst it creates a buffer around the site that we can manage, it also creates the landscape context of what we call landscape, the aesthetic, the social, and it creates meaning around those areas. So to apply that idea to some current archaeological theory and practice, I'm going to tell you about domiciliary areas and domiciliary spaces. So domiciliary spaces are locations where Aboriginal people might come and they might camp, for instance. So within this figure I'm showing you, each of those little half circles represents a whirly, a camping location. And the arrangement of camping locations can be controlled by a whole bunch of Aboriginal traditions and law 
things that we've forgotten, things that we don't know about. We possibly will never know about them, but when we start looking at the archaeology, we can find a concentration of stone artefacts. We might find a hearth. We might even find the remains of an Aboriginal hut. We have done that, or archaeologists have done that in places like Victoria. So when we start looking at these domiciliary areas, what we notice, and this is from a chap, an anthropologist, who's also an architect called Paul Lamott. He's from UQ. He published this little figure a couple of years ago in his book called The Aboriginal Architecture of Australia. And he notes that when you have domiciliary spaces, you have locations in between where you won't have aspects to do with Aboriginal people living. And so when we actually apply the notion of domiciliary spaces as a theory to our archaeological testing model, we suddenly come up with a notion that perhaps these are domiciliary spaces. Are the small blobs locations where distinct campsites were established by Aboriginal people that then tradition said every time they came to this site, they had to go back to the same location. So every time they came into this place, they set up their tents and their campfires, always within the same locations and not in the spaces in between. So for example, we might go camping, you might pitch a tent or you might take your caravan, or you might go up to the mountains and go for a walk somewhere. You might then, five years later, or the next year, or whatever, you might take you know, your uncle Bert back to the same spot. I had a lovely holiday up here. Let's go back. What are you going to do? It's odds on, because Uncle Bert's a bit fussy. You're not going to go randomly wandering around in the bush. You're going to take him to the same spot that you knew about the last time you were there. You want to pitch your tent? You can probably find the location a year later where you pitched your tent exactly the last time, where you had your campfire, the location you cleared. You might have had to remove some vegetation. You might have set up a fire. You might have created a little hearth. It's pretty much odds on you'll go back to the same location. So the archaeology of using domiciliary spaces, applying it to the archaeology of absence, within that tiered kind of inferred mechanism, what I set up to undertake the salvage excavations as a theory was the notion that Aboriginal people were coming back into this landscape and using the same locations, not for one or two year periods, but for thousands and thousands of years. And that worked as an explanation as to why we had stratified sequences, so layer upon layer upon layer of archaeology, in the same location abutted by spaces that didn't have any archaeology in whatsoever. And so that was one of the premises to then set up the research questions and the parameters to come into open excavation. Okay, so that's the background. I'll let you just have a look at those words on the screen a second before we get into the salvage excavations. So the next thing to do after doing the testing was procure the relevant permits. So OEH worked, I worked with OEH to develop the research design and the Aboriginal communities and some other archaeologists. And we determined that we needed to excavate in 12 different locations across this landscape. 12 separate zones, 12 of those little blobs, had archaeology, not just of sufficient context, but of sufficient integrity and condition to warrant open excavation. So our archaeology, we hope, would answer the research questions in this area. We excavated, and so I believe we have identified two distinct landscapes within this area. A domestic landscape, where people undertook everyday activities, and a landscape that has ceremonial and traditional use. I can't say it's ceremonial, for sure, but the archaeology in this landscape is very, very different to anything else that's been seen in Western Sydney to date. We did positively identify locations that have domiciliary evidence, and that relates to the cooking and the food. And when we undertook some scientific analysis of deposits, we managed to obtain OSL dating, so that's optically stimulated luminescence, so dating of stratified sequences, and I'll show you those results, and radio carbon dating that has provided a chronology for this area. We've also got our 8,000 stone artefacts that we got the analysis back from last week, and I'll present a little bit of that analysis. And basically, from the stone objects, we have very distinct evidence for different types of working, not just across the domiciliary area, which is very interesting itself, but completely different stone objects in potentially the ceremonial area. Those little blobs on the screen represent the 12 areas we undertook open excavation on. The yellow areas we didn't really focus on very much. There wasn't a lot of archaeology on, so we moved into the blue areas and concentrated on those. We undertook just under 500 square metres of open excavation. I'm not sure if that is the largest amount of open excavation undertaken on the site in Sydney, but it was pretty much getting up towards it. So, the subject of the talk, cooking in ground ovens. A ground oven is a mechanism by which Aboriginal people are able to cook food without burning it. A ground oven is just like, it's the difference between you cooking in your oven at home and just turning on the gas burners and throwing things on top of the gas burner. 
So for instance, think of two different items. Think of a chicken and think of some, a head of broccoli, for instance. If you took a chicken, and I'm saying a defrosted chicken, and just threw it on the gas burner, on your biggest, highest wok burner, or you took your head of broccoli and threw it on top of that and turned it up to full, what would happen? You'd then send it with a charred, you'd end up with a charred chicken on the outside that's raw in the middle, and the broccoli would probably set on fire after five minutes. You wouldn't be able to eat either. Ground ovens are a mechanism that allows Aboriginal or allowed Aboriginal people to cook things for several hours and cook them properly and all the way through. Research, some of the research I've done in South Australia and research through Victoria and very recent research that's coming out of the Northern Territory has shown that ground ovens are an advent of the last one to one and a half thousand years. So Aboriginal people haven't been using these things for a very, very long period of time. We try to look at why that is. What are the social and the demographic drivers, so those tier two ideas that are changing the economy to make Aboriginal people want to cook in this way? What are the drivers behind it? We'll get into a bit of that, that's some of the interpretation. Anyway, to create a ground oven, what do you do? First of all, you find a bit of ground, you need somewhere you can dig a hole. This is the ground, A1, A2 equals soil that's nice to dig, and the stuff we dig archaeologically. Archaeologically, B equals clay, you don't really want to be digging it. So first of all, you come along and you dig your hole, you end up with a bunch of spoil on the side, you then create a couple of hearths. A hearth is just a campfire. So it's, I remember the first time I went out with Aboriginal people and talked to them about, this is in the Territory, and talked about them making fires, and I thought they were going to create some huge bonfire to cook on. They make these tiny little fires. It takes them about two minutes to get it up to cooking temperature. They're going to cook something that's suitable to cook on a fire. It's really, really quick, and they're really, really small. It's why we don't find them archaeologically everywhere, because they disappear very, very easily. Anyway, with your oven, you put a fire at the bottom of it, you put another fire on the side. Now you don't cook on these glowing embers. You need another medium to then heat that's going to retain the heat that allows you to cook for a couple of hours. And this is where we come to clay balls. Now clay balls are objects, they're made out of clay, and they're objects that do not blow up when you put them in a fire. They're deliberately made by Aboriginal people. We find them in South, in South Australia, up and down the Riverine. We find them through Victoria. We find them in western New South Wales, up and down the Murrumbidgee and the river, the Murray-Darling system. And we're recently finding them, or archaeologists are finding them, in the Northern Territory in association with mounds up there as well. In addition, in the Maroolan area, I've excavated an oven in that area and found cooking stones, so granite cooking stones. So rather than using clay, they're using a stone that's suitable for heating. So these clay balls, or stone, in certain parts of the country, are suitable for heating up to three, four, five hundred degrees C without exploding and then placing them with your food. They're basically like barbecue heat beads. When you've got them up to temperature, you then place them at the bottom of your oven, you then put your food in the oven and you line the food over the top with the clay ball so you use a stick to drag them in. Now what the anthropology has shown us and what the, I guess, other archaeology across the country has shown us is that you can't then just leave the clay balls exposed. You have to put some of your soil back over the top. You've got to cap your oven. You've got to keep the heat in. After a couple of hours, basically what you do is crack open the oven because your food's ready and you pull out the food and it's ready to eat. So that food that can go in, you can have combinations of plant material around it, you might just have meat, you might just have plant material on its own. This little set of diagrams comes from the Victorian Archaeological Survey and was published in 1980. I'll get into some of the research in a minute. Now, as you can see here, we have a sequence of this Aboriginal chap manufacturing his clay or his ground oven with uh, clay balls, etc., etc., and it ends here at the end with a hole and a bunch of clay and balls and a bunch of soil that's been excavated out. Now, what happens is that doesn't just sit there waiting for archaeologists to turn up. Cytophonomy defines that floods are going to come in or some factor is going to come along and disturb the ground, and this hole at the bottom is going to get filled in. Perhaps when the oven is last used, the Aboriginal people just pull the food out and the thing collapses and everything falls back into the hole. But what it means is what you find archaeologically is a cut, you find a depression in the ground, and you will find a bunch of soil, a deposit, that's been excavated at some point that's full of carbon, and you will find the heating medium, whether that be heating cooking stones or clay balls. And from a top, from a planned view, what you end up with is a distinct cut. And so these things are up to about a metre across, then some might be longer, but generally they're kind of oval in shape, and they normally extend down to the clay or slightly into the clay. Now what happens is humans are lazy, fundamentally, and once, once we are, once you've cooked and you've dug this hole in one location, you've made the clay balls, 
you, the next time you need to cook, you're not going to do it somewhere else. You're going to come back to the same location time and time and time again. And so when we've excavated these things in South Australia and the archaeology from Victoria and up and down the River Murray, uh, all through New South Wales has shown that people came back to the same locations and did this time and time and time again. And in South Australia, Victoria, and in Western New South Wales, these things then become known as mounds, ground mounds. It's just in Sydney, these things haven't been identified to date. And I believe they haven't been identified to date because we haven't done much archaeology on the alluvial soil landscapes, and we haven't had the opportunity to investigate these kind of sites, because these locations on alluvial landscapes flood, people don't want to build houses on them, and they're most normally conserved within riparian corridors. I just pulled off some data from the Office of Environment and Heritage, their predictive modelling this morning, uh, the, their predictive modelling, sorry. So this figure shows you the distribution throughout New South Wales that they've recorded what they call earth mounds. So this is ground mother, ground ovens. They can be called ovens, ground ovens, or earth mounds. And as you can see where it's dark, these slides are the same. One is just pre-1790, and this is what happens when you look at what's happened to land surfaces because of historical activities. So if you focus on the slide on the left, the blacker it is indicates the more likelihood you have of founding a ground oven. Now the point of me putting the slide up is to show you the extent that these things exist across New South Wales. As you can see in this coastal location up and down, all the way from the Victoria and New South Wales border, all the way up to the Queensland border, none of these things have been identified in this zone. So we have to start questioning why haven't we found this type of archaeology in this kind of zone when it is so prevalent along these inland riverine systems. One of the question, one of the reasons I suggest, of course, is this is the coast and you can access marine resources, you can access marine foods very, very easily. Marine foods are cooked in a very, very different way to using a ground oven. So one of the questions that instantly comes up is how come we found ground ovens at East Leffington? What were the Aboriginal people doing creating ground ovens at East Leffington? And why are these things here? That comes into who are the people who are at East Leffington, where do these people come from, and what are they doing within this bigger landscape? Another question I've been asked is, is there ethnographic evidence for use of ground ovens in Sydney? So if you read Val Attenborough's book, she has a large chapter on cooking, and she cites pretty much all of the anthropological ethnographic literature. There is only one instance that I've managed to find where an early explorer actually notes the use of a ground oven. You don't have to read it all, but basically it's a chap called Francis Barilla. He was ordered by Governor King to go to the interior in 1802, the interior of New South Wales. And he said when he was in an area which is called Nati, lower near the lower Wallandilly River, it's about 30 to 40 kilometers west of the current study area, he notes that they had wild dogs, and he's saying they're eating the dogs, and he said they roasted the dogs in a hole after the style of the Hunter River natives. So his other descriptions within his text talk about roasting meats on just normal hearths and fireplaces. This is the only instance he specifically cites cooking in a hole. That to me, saying in a hole, when he differentiates it to his other modes of cooking, suggests potentially cooking in a ground oven. The fact he notes it after the style of the Hunter River natives is saying it's after the people from up in the Newcastle area. Now we know from the traditions and the anthropology in the Newcastle area, if we look at the dreaming and the creation stories, you have particular stories that come from the Wiradjuri who do create these ground ovens and these ground mounds. Those traditions and those creation stories go to the Hunter River natives and then comes down the coast to the North Shore of Sydney into that area. And the question would be, are the Aboriginal people, because they have very distinct tribal zones, are they moving between locations for ceremony? So are tribal groups moving from one tribe's area to another tribe's area to partake of communal ceremonial activities? Getting into that is another lecture altogether, but the research that's out there suggests that there are distinct ceremonies that occur to do with male initiation, to do with particular trades of particular goods, including marriage ceremonies, that would require people to move very, very long distances. The research I've done in South Australia looks at this particular kind of aspect, and what we've done is look at territoriality, and we've looked at the notion of people living in one area, but moving to other areas for certain times of the year. And what we found in South Australia from stable isotope analysis is that on average, people move for about two weeks a year from inland locations to coastal locations. It's in their bones. It's in the stable isotopes. It's fundamentally the tier one data. It is what it is. So 
And what I question, one of the hypotheses, is that East Lappington are these people, are the Aboriginal people coming into East Lappington for some kind of activity, and when they come to East Lappington, they're bringing with them their culture and their traditions from their own lands and applying them to the East Leppington landscape. Another question has been asked of me is, have ovens been excavated in Sydney before? Now, we didn't, everyone had told me no one's excavated any ovens in Sydney before, but going through an awful lot of other consulting reports, I found that Jo MacDonald, who we work with on a regular basis, one of her reports from 2003 of Xavier College, which is in Western Sydney, it's up near Penrith in that area up there, they actually detail excavation of ground ovens and clay balls in that area in a very comparable context to those we found at East Leppington. So they're excavating alluvial landscapes, they're excavating alluvial soils that they state are stratified. And in this report, they specifically say that we are finding excavations down at defined cuts with concentrations of deliberately baked clay balls. And one of their hypotheses that they come to the conclusion of at the end of the report is the fact that these relate to an Aboriginal cultural activity. They don't take the interpretation any further at that, uh, in this report, unfortunately, but given the amount of evidence that we found at East Leppington, which is quite substantially more than they found at Xavier College, it kind of adds to the weight of, what's of, of this kind of archaeology in Western Sydney. Another question I've had is, are these things actually burnt trees? So archaeologists often go out in Western Sydney and they're digging on that blacktown soil, and they often find burnt trees across the landscape. Now, I won't go into the, the text underneath the slides, but we have deliberately excavated a number of burnt trees on this site and other sites in Western Sydney. We've excavated them stratigraphically to try and get at the archaeological information that shows you the difference between what an oven is and what a burnt tree is. And they're chalk and cheese. If you excavate these things stratigraphically and carefully by hand using a trowel, you have a completely different archaeological signature between a tree, a burnt tree, and a cultural oven. So for instance, when you come down onto the top of both, ovens have a very smooth outline, a very defined cut line, the extent of where the Aboriginal people cut the shape of the oven into the ground. Burnt trees do not have that cut line. They have the remnants of where the tree trunk was in the ground. Sometimes they're nice and round. Sometimes they're really, really angular. Within the actual fill of the feature, you have with a burnt tree, very heavy defined carbon. The carbon is laid in a single direction because burnt trees, they have tree trunks. The xylem within the tree trunks grows in a linear manner. Within an oven, you do not have the linear nature of carbon alignment. Carbon goes all over the shop because average people have been digging it out to get the food out. The hearths have just been dumped in. So the pieces of carbon you have are all over the shop. There's no linearity to the carbon. When you start excavating these things with burnt trees, you often have the remains of a burnt tree in the hole. In the ovens we've excavated, there's not been in any one oven the remains of a burnt tree. They're completely different. The constituent particles within the ovens themselves are entirely different. They comprise of the fill, the silty fill, often a very fine soil, full of carbon. The clay balls, which, as you'll see in a minute, sometimes can be intact and form a distinct stratigraphical layer. And basically, they're chalk and cheese. You can't mistake a tree for an oven. Now, some of the research that was done in the 1970s, the late 70s and the early 80s, by the Victorian Archaeological Survey on the mounds and the ovens in Victoria published a paper on the difference between trees and ovens as well. And one of the things they say is that burnt trees have an irregularity to the section profile. So as you can see here, it, come, it comes at this angle, it goes down sharply here, it forms this curve at the bottom where the tree taproot is pushed into the clay, it rises at a different angle, flat, goes up again, and then comes across. Ovens are smooth. They have a curve. This is not my research. This is what's coming out of Victoria. They have a curve, a linearity to the curve, and outside of the cut line, they are smooth. There is not no random roots coming out. There's no random pieces coming out. And all of the ovens we've excavated at Leppington have smooth, curved, and defined, clear, linear cut lines to their outer extremities. This is the volume I'm citing. There's two volumes, 79 and 80, and this is Marjorie Sullivan's paper, Distinguishing Between Aboriginal and Natural Mounds. I've talked to Marjorie about it, and she's provided a lot of information. In terms of what's going on with the mounds, these guys were the research. These guys did this stuff back at this date. There's basically been no further research on mounds in Australia since 1980. There's been a few papers here and there. However, some students, there's a PhD that's 
currently being done on clay cooking balls. And we've given them, we just said, come and look at all our balls. You can have all our data. Go for it. Open access, you can do what you want, including your PhD. The lecturer at ANU, she's doing research on the Northern Territory Mountains. She presented at AAA last year. And then I've been chatting to her quite extensively about the evidence that's coming out of those and the dating of those mounds as well. We're also I'm working with the South Australian Museum and one of my former PhD supervisors on the mounds in Adelaide too. Now what's coming out of all this research, so the dated mounds from the 1980s, the mounds from the Northern Territory and all the mounds from South Australia, is that the mounds and the ground ovens are all created in the last 1,000 years. So one of the key questions before we got into this research was, what are the dates for these ovens? And so what I'm going to do is run through some of the ovens and show you the kind of stuff that's coming out of the ovens and the dates for them. So the first oven we're looking at, this was actually on Blacktown soil, an absolute miracle. It was retained here. This is a section of it, and as you can see, it's got some nice little feeder channels going in, perhaps with a hearth on the outside, and they dragged coals and clay balls in. And at use over time has created some smooth channels going down into the oven. When you look at the fill, it has a distinct cut, so it's half sectioned. We worked out a way of excavating these things so we could section them in half, come down to the top of them, get the whole outline of the oven, the cut line at the top. See the cut line coming around here in this figure? And then we half excavated, so we literally went to the half point and then excavated it stratigraphically down if there were different layers inside of it, so we could get a perfect section profile through the middle of it. And you can see in this one you have a lovely smooth curve with a layer of carbon and clay balls, a distinct layer in the middle, and then a layer of little carbon on the top. Going on to the second one, again you can see the outer cut line, and we have the little white triangles, you can see the difference in the colour. So this is now on that alluvial soil, SC stands for South Creek, so that's the alluvium. Beautiful cut line going around it. There's the cut line shown here with evidence of clay balls popping up inside the thing. We radiocarbon dated this one. It's 236 years old. So that's from 1950, so you do 1950 minus that date. So this predates Europeans turning up and within the last 1,000 years. This one was a really awesome example. Again, a perfect cut line with fires on the outside. And when we excavated those fires, they had small, shallow holes. Some of the clay balls that came out of this were really unusual. I have no idea of what they were pushing into these clay balls, but they appear to have pushed some kind of seed into the clay balls to then roast in an ancillary part of the oven. Imagine if you have a baker's oven, an old type of, or an arga. You know, you have your central firebox, and the ovens nearest the firebox are really hot. The ovens further away from the firebox are not quite as hot. I believe they're doing that with these ground ovens. They know the central section is going to reach 200 C, the outer sections might reach 150, so they're putting different food in different spaces away. These people have a complete mastery of how to control the temperature and the cooking times in these ovens, I believe. So again, we dated this one, some of the carbon, 334 years ago. This was the piece de la resistance, so excavating this trench, we started excavating it down and we came on top of an oven. Excellent, another oven, I think it's about the fourth or fifth one by this point in time. Great, another oven. We started excavating it out and we came across a layer of clay balls. And we're like, hang on a second, something's going on here. So the guys excavating it ran across and, and grabbed me. We said, right, okay, let's be really, really careful with this one. This one was intact. So this one, its final cooking period, its final cooking event, when they pulled the food out, half of the oven, as you can see in this figure on the bottom, left, the bottom right here, had remained intact. The clay ball layer was still there. The soil over the top of the clay ball layer was still there. On the right hand side where the food had come out, the oven had collapsed because they pulled the food out. But then a flood event had come in, flooded the oven, but not with sufficient energy to take apart the stratigraphy of the oven. And so in this photo on the bottom right, you can see, going from outside to inside, a silty alluvium over the top. This is fill from the oven. So this was different. This fill is different from the soil in the trench. A layer, a distinct layer, as you can see in this photo here on the top left, a band of clay balls sitting over the top of a matrix inside the oven. This is a flood matrix. This is the silty stuff that's come in inside the oven. This was different to the layer of soil the Aboriginal people had put over the top. We actually then had an air void. There was actually an air pocket remaining still within the oven. And as you can see at the bottom, we have grey ash. So we actually have, just as a very thin layer at the bottom of the oven, the remains of the hearth with a lump of carbon in it. Just a very thin veneer. It's about two mil thick across the bottom of the oven. And then on this side, we had alluvium that had floated in. Now, we thought this was really rather special. So what we did was we got WYSIWYG, the 3D scanning people, to come down. And here we have the head of WYSIWYG. And 
he's using his 3D scanner to 3D scan, 3D scan the thing in situ. Okay. The point of this is to build and laser print, 3D print this model of the oven here, and it's right here, it's in front of me. So I brought you, and you can have a look at it later. This is that oven. When they 3D scan it, it's sub-millimeter accurate. And what we did was we got him to scan it in that partially excavated condition. We then excavated the stratigraphical layers out of the oven, and he scanned it at each time we took a layer out. So first of all, we took out the remains of the silt. So we took out the silt that they had used to pack the top of the oven. So Aboriginal people had put this layer in. We then got him to rescan it, and we had a little more of the clay balls exposed. We then took out further silt from another quadrant, and what we were left with was the layer of the clay balls, in situ clay balls over the top of the oven. We then removed those clay balls and the remainder of the fill. We took a sample of carbon from the base of the oven, and as you can see, it was dated to 687 years ago. We then removed all of the fill, so we had the original cut line, which actually cut down into the clay, and then he rescanned it again. So we have a perfect three-dimensional model, and Stockland are going to have this, they're hoping to have this thing cast in bronze and put back into the, in this area in the landscape for interpretation. And so we have this perfect three-dimensional model that's conserved in perpetuity of the oven. Now that date is very interesting, and as an archaeologist, you probably notice it's down four strat well, that's four stratigraphical layers down, I'm telling you this stratigraphy here. This suggests that date is the last date they used the oven. It was then buried in a flood post that date. So what it means is the layers above have all formed as a consequence of alluvium coming in. But surrounding it in the rest of the trench, we might have different archaeological layers of mud. So it's suggesting Aboriginal people where they're creating ovens are digging down, digging holes through the alluvium. So one of the keys when we look at our archaeology is to work out the taphonomic, how the sites have formed, and work out where we have defined layers of stone versus where we have ovens and how the Aboriginal people have, have altered these sites. Next, we had a very interesting stone artifact location, a location with a couple of thousand stone artifacts, but we happen to have zones with ovens right next to it. So one of the things that we got out of the Joe McDonald report from Xavier College, one of the things she said is, when you approach the oven, the stone artifacts drop right off, and you get this remains of clay balls within this carbon matrix. Now that we'd found that exactly the same pattern at East Leppington, and if we didn't find the Joe McDonald report until afterwards, and that was one of the things we were working on, is where you find ovens, you don't find stone artifacts. But in this area, we have ovens and stone artifacts together. So you've got an oven partially excavated, and this complex of ovens. Oven cut into oven with half on half on half in this one particular zone across here. This is all of the stone artefacts combined. So all the stratigraphical layers of the stone artefacts just squashed down together, which, if you followed what I was saying earlier, isn't the best thing to do because you want to interpret them layer by layer. But if we just look at it as a means of understanding where the stone is versus where the ovens are, the hashed lines are where we have ovens and the stone objects around them. So you see this area in the south, you've got very few objects, stone objects around, but a large, a lovely oven. But in this central area here, we have lots and lots of stone artefacts and also lots and lots of ovens. An oven in this zone and an oven in this zone that don't have a lot of artefacts. We also, this is the only site we got the remains of bone from. I believe it's a macropod, so it's some kind of small skippy animal. But we got 50 bone samples from this site. And when I dated those, they're literally around 1800. So they're a crossover period between Aboriginal people and Europeans coming in. If you remember, I said the land grant was 1812. We actually, in association with some of the historic excavations, found some glass objects in and around this area. So we know the Aboriginal people were interacting with the Europeans at that end, that crossover point. So we've got evidence of these people using, the Aboriginal people using this area right up and into the historic period. You've got evidence of ovens and stone artefacts together. And one of the things I'll look at now, I've got the stone artefacts, is, is their heat treatment of the stone objects? Where's that heat treatment? Are they chucking the stones, the raw stone material, into the ovens to cook with the animals to change the properties of the stone. What stone is coming out of this site and where is it coming out of, basically? So it's a very interesting site. The thing to note is you've got these are, by the way, these are 50 millimeter squares, so the half meter excavation squares. So four of them make a meter square. You've got these big numbers, so the, the darker the blue, the higher the density, 47, that equates around just under 200 artifacts per square meter. But if you notice, we stopped excavating where the numbers fall down, and you'll notice how constrained the artefacts are around the edge. And here's our test units. We put in further test units to see if the archaeology extended out. And as you can see, you've got zero, zeros, two, one, one. And around the edge, you've got all these zeros and ones. So when we looked at this site, you've got all this archaeological evidence. You've got a date that takes you right up to the end of European occupation. You've got three layers of artefacts, stratified artefacts. 
and what Beth's analysis has shown us that in this site, the artifacts in layer one are different to the artifacts in layer two, are different to the artifacts in layer three. So they're distinct, different artifacts, and she said that that difference cannot have occurred due to just a random chance. It is statistically proven, yet you have a constrained site. You have an edge to it. You have a boundary in which Aboriginal people were working. So if we've got stratified sequences, and we could say they go back a couple of thousand years based on the type of material and type of stone artifacts being made, Aboriginal people were coming to this location, this very specific location for that long period of time, and cooking here and making stone artifacts. And they weren't going two metres outside of this location. They were coming back to the same spot time and time and time again and making stone artifacts. And I think that's quite important. Now, taking that idea and that notion, we're then going to look at area three, which I'm calling a habitation area, because we have a lot more evidence within it. And what we did was open up, we put in four trenches. Again, these are half a metre square, so this is 20 metres between trench A and trench D, 20 metres between B and C. And we excavated a trench in between, because we wanted to look at not where the stones were, we wanted to look at the archaeology of nothing, where there zones with nothing in it. This area was adjacent to the creek, beautiful alluvium. It was on a fundamentally like a large raised kind of mound, a mounded zone. I'm not saying the whole thing was a cultural mound, because it most definitely wasn't. It was a natural mound of raised alluvium. It was pretty poor conditions when we excavated, and there's Peter Woodley under his makeshift bivouac excavating one of the trenches. Trench A, three layers of stratigraphy, 158 stone objects, a cluster of clay balls in it that were not used for cooking. We're doing some XRD analysis on all the different clay balls to work out if there's difference between the clay balls and the different ovens. These clay balls are very different. We've been doing a whole bunch of science experiments on the clay balls, but haven't got the results, so I'm not going to go into that at the minute. So trench A, stone artifacts only, but this weird cluster of clay balls in a stratified and defined lozenge. B, lower density of stone art artifacts, but above a background scatter. C, not many stone artifacts, but a whole bunch of evidence for cooking. And this is when we take off layer one, and you can see the blackened areas, they're about 40 to 50 mil thick, and they're evidence of hearth, so little cooking fires. And in it, we had a cut line top of an oven. This was an oven cut into an oven, cut into an oven, which is in this area here. Dated this half here, you can see in the section, and we came back with a date nearly 3,000 years old. So you've got a trench where you've only taken off strat layer one, and it's 3,000 years old. So remember that date of 3,000 at the interface between layer one and layer two. And then you've also got ovens cut down into it. 3D, here's Sam Player, here's our project geomorphologist. He's looking at the stratigraphy from a geomorphological point of view, from a geological point of view. He's doing a whole bunch of science on it. That's going to happen once he's finished his PhD. If you're listening to this, Sam, get on with it. <laughs> so as you can see here, I didn't want to do the OSL analysis of this trench. Sam did it for me. That's his job. So we got OSL dating back. This is the first time anyone outside of GML has seen this. Layer 1, modern day to 4,000 years old paired radiocarbon from that other trench of 3,000 years old. All the other ovens, remember, are in the last 1,000 years. The second layer down, 4 to 7,000 years old, 7 to 11, and then 11 to 17,000 years old. So we have defined stratigraphy. We knew it was, as we were digging it, you could feel the difference. You could even hear the difference with your trowel. You can see in the third layer here, you can see all these carbon flecks at the interface between the, the second and the third layer. See these little lumps of black? These do not occur in the other layers, so they're constrained to that layer. There is some bioturbation at the top of this, and we're working on Sam to work at the model of bioturbation, but the bioturbation hasn't just mixed the whole profile. These layers have been constrained geomorphologically, and that has come out in stone artifact analysis. And as you can see, spit one, not a great deal of artifacts in this particular area at this particular time, so that's up to 4,000 years old. Layer two, Lots of artefacts in very defined locations, again the darker blue, the artefacts. And layer three, different densities of artefacts at different locations. Most interestingly, layer four, which is post 11,000 years old, fundamentally no artefacts. I think there's, there's what, five or six artefacts out of that whole layer. So this establishes a chronology of when Aboriginal people came into this area. So what I'm saying is that 11,000 years ago, Aboriginal people were not here. This area started flooding and laying down this alluvium 11,000 years ago. Aboriginal people started occupying this area at this point here. This is very important because it starts to provide a chronology for all the stone artefacts and the typologies of stone we get out of these zones and these areas. And we can relate the technologies of the stones to these dates. I'm not sure. There have been a couple of other sites in Sydney that have been dated by OSL and they have presented 
similar types of chronology. When we excavated the trenches in between, we basically found very, very little, very little physical evidence. And here's a plot, this is all the stone artifacts with the features. You can see zeros and ones, odd stone here and there. Concentration again in the middle. This is the kitchen, the area they were cooking, and cooking for thousands of years. So what I'm suggesting is when they came in over that long, long period, they made stone artifacts in location one, two, three, and four, and they always cooked here. Why did they always do that? Possibly it's a dominant ciliary area. So in that plan I showed you by Lamotte, you had locations for habitation, you had locations for putting the huts, the whirlies, and you had locations for making the stone artifacts. There is some Aboriginal tradition that says when you come here, you put your huts perhaps in this zone or this zone, you make your stone artifacts here or here, and you cook down here. And that tradition has been passed on, potentially, based on the date of 3,000 years, for at least 3,000 years. Yes, there's stone artifacts in these trenches that date back 10,000 years, but that tradition says for 10,000 years you make the artifacts here and here, and in this location here. You don't make them down here. It relates to that idea of a domiciliary area, it relates to Aboriginal tradition, it relates to that kind of third tier interpretation of passing on an oral tradition that say how you use an area. So the next question is what were they cooking in these ovens? And so what I started to look at and what we've been looking at in South Australia and what people have looked at in Victoria is what do they cook in these ovens? Now as I mentioned, you in across Sydney, all the anthropology and ethnography suggest they're using small fires. And when you go and you spend time with Aboriginal people in areas where they're able to undertake traditional activities still, they often cook seafood on small fires. They never, I've never seen them create an oven. But when, say, you go up into the Territory and they want to create an oven, they build grand ovens, they're cooking meats and sometimes they cook vegetables in them. Now, a lady called Beth Gott in 1980, she started undertaking analysis of the plant remains and how, from some of the ovens and how they actually undertake cooking in these ovens. And so she published this little table here and she's looking at different wetland plants and dryland plants and she's looking at how you cook them in the ovens. And being a bioarchaeologist and having a background in this field, I started looking at what they were cooking in the oven and why they were cooking in it. Now when you get a large number of Aboriginal people together, you need to give them enough food. And if you have a large number of Aboriginal people together for a length of time, one or two weeks, you need a lot of food, you need it easily accessible, and you need to be able to cook it so that it doesn't give everyone food poisoning. When I've looked at places like Maroulin, where and in the ACT, where the anthropology and ethnography suggests there's meetings of one to two thousand Aboriginal people for ceremony and tradition, this is in 1800, 1820, it's suggesting that we can have huge numbers of people coming together for very long periods of time. Now if in Sydney, in your inland, you can't access the coast, so you can't go out and you can't stick a net across and you can't pull out you know, 500 fish from the sea, you need to be able to access a huge amount of food. One of the easiest ways that the bioarchaeologists and the bioarchaeological studies have shown people to get food is from plant food. Plants grow in large abundance, they are easily accessed, they don't run away, they're easy to access, you can easily dig them up and pull them out of watercourses, particularly the rhizomes and the roots and you can cook them quite simply, you can prepare them, cook them quite simply. And what Beth has said in her papers is that the rhizomes, particularly of the wetland plants, particularly things like the borosh, which is named as typha, it grows all over the world, and it grows in this part of Sydney in the wetlands, things like typha provide a lot of food and can be used by Aboriginal people to sustain a large part of the diet. And my bioecological studies from the oyster analysis have shown that in inland locations, Aboriginal people are eating men and women are eating about 40 to 50% plant food. This is like every day of their life as part of their diet. So they're used to eating plant food. Aboriginal people didn't just eat meat, they ate a lot of plant food. Now, if they want to eat something like typha, you can't just pull it out and eat it. It actually has a complex carbohydrate in the root. It's like eating grass, you can't eat grass. Your body can't break it down. But if you cook it, it breaks down the complex carbohydrates into monosaccharides and disaccharides, and means you can eat it. And the only way of cooking something like typha without burning it is to place it in a ground oven. You need to steam it in a ground oven. So the hypothesis I have is that these ground ovens are being used to feed a large number of people a lot of food and they need to access local resources. And I'm suggesting they're getting something like typha out of these local swampy wetland areas that exist next to the domiciliary areas. And that's why they're creating ground ovens in an area like East Lappington, and that's why you won't find them on the coast, because they don't have the need to create ground ovens to cook this amount of food at that point in time. I'm also suggesting, based on the stone artifacts, we got some quite unusual results from stone artifacts, so each of those different areas 
have different types of stone artifacts in them and different concentrations of materials in the different layers. But people are coming from some distance away, bringing in with them stone. And Beth has said that most, a lot of the stone that's coming into this area has been previously worked before being brought in. She's saying the silkrete has been reduced greatly, the mudstone and the other types of stone that's been brought in has been reduced before it's been brought into this area. There are no local sources of stone in this area, it should be noted as well. But if these people are coming in, if people are coming into East Lappington from a long distance away, they are bringing with them the resources, they're bringing with the technological know-how, and the people who are perhaps coming from further inland, from the central highlands, from the inland areas, are bringing in the technology of how to cook in ground ovens. We're in this area, we're doing our thing, we need to cook, let's get the typhra out, out of the creeks, let's cook it, let's put it in the ground oven. And so it sets up the premise for them, what were they doing in this area? What on earth are they up to? And this then leads us to that second landscape. So we have the first landscape, this domestic landscape, with all these stone artifacts in it, different types of stone, all these ground ovens and all this cooking evidence. And then you go into this second type of landscape. Now this landscape is next to those big hills. So those big hills with the view corridor, the Aboriginal people, the first time I went in here, they said to me, this area is important, these hills are important. We don't know why these hills are important. We have some vague oral tradition that's told us it's been this notion that these hills were used for something. You saw the views you got off the top of them. It's kind of logical they would be. The last, the anthropology of the Sydney area says the last ever corroboree was held in the Denham Court area, in and around this area. Now, the second landscape, this traditional ceremonial landscape, it's separate from those domiciliary areas. There's those other low hills that separate it. So when you're in those cooking areas, you can't see this landscape I'm talking about. There's no visual line of sight. And that's potentially quite important in the Aboriginal use of these ceremonial areas. Because for Aboriginal people, they might have, they have staging areas. They have zones where they'll go, and the families, and whoever, everyone you know is involved, sits in those areas. And when the tradition occurs, people are called in. So part of the journey of getting into these areas and taking the tradition is just as important as the location itself. And recognising that is very important. And in this ceremonialia, we have two distinct types of archaeology. We have a stone archaeology, and we have something occurring with trees. I'll show you the trees in a second. But Area 7 gives us some stone archaeology. We radiocarbon dated a couple of small hearts in it to the last 1,000 years, 925. We got a whole bunch of really unusual stone, very high concentration of back blades in one trench, stratigraphic layers of very highly worked stone in another trench. There's a lot of stone that has I would consider it to be decorated. So you can see on the right of the figure, you've got these backed artifacts that have a white top to them, and a red underneath. No one can tell me what these mean. This is a kind of a third tier interpretation. Can't ever prove that these were used for something, but I believe they've been deliberately manufactured in this way for some traditional use. The Aboriginal people saw these and valued them very, very highly. They said these are very important. We can't tell you what they were for, but they're very important. Something's going on with them. We also found some very unusual backed artifacts in this area. The top left is one of the largest back blades ever recovered from Sydney, so it's 55 millilitres long, it's actually snapped. Beth tells us she's only recovered three other backed artifacts of that length in all her lifetime's work in the Sydney area. Yeah, we had one here. We found this uh, ground edge X, or well, it's not a ground edge digging stone, it looks like. Just some of the pictures that Beth took in her analysis. I don't expect you to go into the detail in this table, but basically, there's the third column says Chal Sydney, which is a very fine grain and very high quality stone. You'll see I've got counts of 53 and 3. So we have a total of 56 of these Chal Sydney objects. You say, well, that's not very many, given he had 8,000 objects in total. But if I tell you that the whole excavation out of that 8,000 objects, there was only, I think, 93 Chal Sydney objects in total. Yet one trench has the majority of them. So this and most of those Chelsea Sydney objects were very highly worked. They were the, the best quality objects, the backed artifacts, the very highly skilled objects. Also in this trench, in the silkrete, you had and what Beth described as poor quality silkrete that hasn't been worked very much and is just generally discarded. Now if you take into account what I was saying a minute ago, that all this stone has been brought into the area and worked before <coughs> it's brought in. Stone is a very valued commodity in this area. It's not something you just have a hack at and throw away. Yet in this trench, and in this trench only, people have been having a hack at the silkrete and throwing it away. And you juxtapose that with a whole bunch of very high quality objects. It's very unusual. So if you look at in terms of the interpretation, the interpretation in tier one, that lowest level says 
you have an unusual assemblage in this trench. If you place networks around how the material got here, you say those networks are very unusual. But when you place it into the third tier of interpretation, you start saying, well, perhaps there's some people showing and making very, very high quality objects in here. There's also other people making very, very poor quality objects in here, having a hack at the stone and throw it away. Who could that be? I would say it would be highly skilled Aboriginal men and very unskilled Aboriginal men. If you look at who those people would be in society, you have the elders and you have the initiates. That again is an interpretation, but it fits the archaeological data in this area. When you combine that with the landscape, this very unusual landscape location that's separate from the domiciliary areas, separated and underneath the hills, and you combine it with the excavation adjacent to that stone artifact site, you start to realise that something very unusual is happening here. And so we started excavating this area and we did some geophysics on this area as well and we identified some heating signatures, so we identified magnetic signatures and we placed our trenches over those magnetic signatures and lo and behold we came down, this is when we taken, the photograph showed when we taken off the first spit and we took off and it was a Ludnam soil, so it was a colluvial soil and we came down and we came down onto South Creek Alluvium and we found two identical circular cuts, nothing like ovens, really large cuts. These trenches are, the bottom one is three metres long and the top one is two and a half metres long. So the cuts were about a metre and a half to two metres in width and they're circular. Above it there was no indication of the cut, but when we came down to the cut it was black. It was really distinct, full of carbon. And we're looking at them, what on earth is going on here? So I can see the photographs of what turned out to be two trees, very unusual trees. So the way we excavated it is we started excavating just with inside that black cut. So we want to treat it like a historical feature. So we're taking out stratigraphically 50 centimetre by 50 centimetre inside that cut. We start coming down onto the right onto some very thin layers of clay that's been cooked, pushed in in situ. And underneath that clay there's more black carbon and there's more South Creek alluvium. So it's not clay that's been randomly flooded in, but it's clay that's been deliberately put in that situation to that context. As this is one of the trees, as we come down, the photograph on the left, you can see, we can start seeing bands of clay appearing. Clay and a concentration of black in the middle. The photograph on the right, there's a little, there's a feature here. So within the cut of the, the cut of the feature, we have, these are the tree roots which have been burnt and have rotted out. And you can see them extending out. That's what a tree looks like when you dig it. But outside of the tree, we have this defined cut. So we've excavated out the black soil and this is now down onto intact in situ South Creek alluvium. So it's a dish. It's a dish of alluvium around the outside of the tree. So this alluvium hasn't been excavated. We've just removed the fill from inside that dish. And then we have this feature, we have a pit on the north side of the tree. Here it is. You can see the smooth outer edge. This is the cut for it, a band of clay. And this is it as we start to excavate it. So we've now, and what it turned out to be was a pit. It was about half a metre deep, and it was cut down, straight sides down. It was cut down into the clay underneath, just as a pit. Within this particular tree, a tree root had actually gone across, and there was actually, they'd cut the tree root out. And you could see the axe marks where they'd cut the tree root out at some point. Within this pit, there were clay balls. There were some clay balls in there, and there were also white clay balls. And the white clay, the Aboriginal people inferred as uh, you'd call it a kind of a white clay, uh, related to like a pipe clay, but Aboriginal people told me, the Aboriginal people on the excavation told me it's the kind of clay that would be used in a ceremony by males. And you need to cook that clay to create a clay suitable for using as body paint. So the suggestion is that these pits, they know how to cook with clay balls, the clay balls give them heat, they heat the clay balls, they put them in the pit, they put the white clay in, they fill the pit in with carbon, it cooks the relevant clay they're going to use in ceremony, and they remove it. This is the second tree that we excavated. This tree was even better intact condition. You can see in this first photograph on the left, this is the cut coming down, so we've removed the carbon. And in this one, we come across a band of clay. In situ, you can see the colours in it, that it's cooked, and then it stops. You can see it coming around as a circular band of clay. So you have a tree in the middle, <coughs> they've excavated down, excavated a dish, half a metre away, all the way around the tree, still within the alluvium, and then they've pushed in clay all the way around it, and then they've cooked that clay around the tree. For some reason the clay all the way around is cooked. And this clay layer, which is sitting on basal alluvium, so it's not sitting on the basal clay, it's as a thin, it's only a centimetre or so deep, and it just sits around the tree. 
this is just a little video of us actually um, excavating it. And this is the edge of the clay. So you can see how the clay pops up. This is the burnt clay sitting as a ring around this tree within that cut. You can see how dark the soil is. And you can see when we take, took off the fill that had covered the clay, it just pops up. And it was only, as I said, it was only about a centimeter thick. And underneath it was the base of the cut. So we excavated half of it so we could get a section through. And you can see here's the dish cut and the clay coming around. So on this side, even though the clay, because of the, the site formation, the taphonomic process, the clay has been washed away by alluvium flooding it. But there was very thin, it was about a millimeter or so of clay in and around. And the alluvium underneath had obviously been cooked. It had turned a slightly different color. This is that tree when it's finished being excavated. And again, you can see the outline of the tree. So we got one excavated tree and a second excavated tree, both with a dish, both with a pit on the south side. This is the clay pushed up against the tree. So you can see how distinctly the tree trunk ends and the clay is pushed up right up to that tree trunk. This is a picture of the top of the pit and here's a piece of white clay sitting within the matrix of clay balls. Then you can see the nodules of white clay sitting on the edge of the pit pushed up against the tree trunk. And on the photograph on the right, you have the finished excavation of that tree. So you have the tree, the pit, the residual clay in situ, and all around it, intact alluvium. Now, when we excavated the fill sitting above this clay, we recovered a number of silkrete objects, fundamentally silkrete, and they happen to be those really poor quality, hacked at silkrete objects, like the one we found in the other trench. We didn't find any chalcedony, found hardly any of the type of material in this trench at all just this very, very poor quality. So what can we take out of this excavation of the trees? Well, we know we have a tree. We know the Aboriginal people have excavated a circle of a dish around the tree. They then packed that dish with clay. They then cooked that clay in situ. They dug pits on both sides of the tree, on both trees, facing the same direction and facing that trench with the unusual artifacts in it. Within that pit, we have some clay balls, like the clay balls these in their cooking sites, and we have white clay that's associated with ceremony. We then have objects sitting on top of the clay in and around these trees. So the next thing was we dated it, got to date it. So we get two trees. Trees have the same date, roughly the same date, 800, 380 BP and 362 years before present. That is the date at which the tree burnt. These trees, the ecologists tell me, we're not sure on the species yet, we're hopefully going to get a, an idea on the species, but they're probably four or five hundred years old when they burnt. So it's all within the last 1,000 years. We got carbon out of the pits, and the carbon out of the pits was stratigraphically and separate from the trees. The carbon from pit two, roughly the same age as the trees, but the carbon from pit one is only 190 years old. So the carbon from that pit shows that that pit was being used after the tree had been burnt. So they're using this thing tree has burnt, but they're still using that pit for a long, long period, possibly right up until Europeans turned up, which correlates and falls in with that small piece of anthropology that says this area is being used by Aboriginal people for cookeries. So how do you interpret the cooking and how do you interpret these ceremonial things? So what I'm suggesting at the minute is that we have two very distinct landscapes used for two very distinct purposes. The archaeology in them is completely different. This area has a very, very long use of history by Aboriginal people. It goes back 10,000 years. The first evidence of cooking from the hearth in that area three is 3,000 years ago. However, all of the ovens, and we dated eight of them by radiocarbon, all have dates from the last 1,000 years. The youngest is 236 years ago, which just predates European people turning up in Australia. And the oldest is just under 900 years BP. So the ovens fall perfectly within the chronological sequence that we see in South Australia, in Victoria, and the Northern Territory. And it suggests that holistically across Australia, some very, very large economic shift is occurring in Aboriginal society. And I believe that that shift is related to social and demographic factors in Aboriginal society and uh, the way that the Aboriginal people are using and controlling and managing their territories. And I suggest that at East Leppington, because we have these two distinct landscapes, people are coming into this area to undertake some form of ceremony connected with the Leppington Hills. And the evidence and the reason why we find this evidence for cooking and the ovens and the range of stone objects and the length of use in this area 
is because they're using that domiciliary area as a staging zone. And that's why archaeological excavations to the north and the south that have been undertaken for other recent projects haven't found similar archaeological evidence. They just haven't found the archaeology. It all relates to this Aboriginal landscape, this domiciliary landscape, and the traditional and ceremonial landscape in East Lethington. That's what we found. Absolutely fascinating to see the archaeology, and, and especially archaeology that's been dug for a client, but that whole analysis and the approach to it that traces those various levels of meaning and what's going on. Has anyone got any questions? Well, I do. Oh. I'm sorry, but it's still not clear to me what alerted you to go to that site to excavate it? In the first place? That's right. Did you hear about it or um, what made you go there? Yeah. So there's a statutory requirement in this state for developers and anyone undertaking an impact to the land to indicate in the first instance a due diligence approach to heritage, to Aboriginal heritage and to historic heritage. So I do a lot of work for Stockland, and Stockland said, please can you look at this landscape? Can you tell me, and this was before the land was rezoned. And so at that point, we went to Stockland, and I said, you're gonna have a lot of stuff in this, and you're gonna to have to manage it. And I gave them examples of how we'd managed other development sites for them. And I said, well, given these hills, and I chatted to some of the Aboriginal guys, and got some of the elders, people like Glenda Chalker, to come and talk to me about the place. And she said something, this is important, so I'm going to tell you it's important before you even go in there. Something, there's going to be something good in there. And so I then talked to the OEH, uh, the government, and the Department of Planning, and with the Aboriginal community and those two government bodies in Stockland, we sat down and started having meetings to work out the strategic approach to this landscape. Because what we wanted to do was undertake conservation where possible of the high value archaeology in this landscape. So I haven't gone into that side of things, I haven't gone into it deliberately. But within this landscape, we have deliberately conserved a number of archaeological sites that I haven't even test excavated. So there's a number of locations that are likely to have even more evidence of ovens and cookings. And one of those hills, for instance, is built into the development footprint and they cannot touch it. They can't do anything to it. It's going to sit as a natural meadow. And there's an area next to the riparian corridor that, again, they cannot touch. It will sit as a natural meadow. And so we have conservation. And so what alerted me to it was what the Aboriginal people told me in the first place, coupled with Stockland's statutory requirement for needing to go and investigate that area. The surrounding trees we saw, will they stay? A lot of them will stay, yes. So those trees, a lot of them are located within the riparian corridor, and the riparian corridor is a riparian corridor in the development. They have to do some creek stabilisation because the creek is not particularly uh, good condition. So, but a lot of that riparian corridor in the development plan uh, it stays as a green zone through the middle. And the creek would have been their water supply? The creek would have been used as a, as a, as a regular water supply. Thank, thank you. So, yeah. um, you. Right at the beginning there was a map that you had that had um, things, red things on it that were supposed to be help. That map, was that one of the one, things that you had to show that there was... Yes, the, the little dots. So yeah. from OEH's register, just on based on that register, that meant they had to go and get permits and things like that. Right. So imagine they just had that and the whole land had been completely stripped and ploughed and farmed and everything else, and there wasn't any archaeology there. They'd still have to get obtain statutory process, uh, permits to allow them to develop. And how so. is it known that the first sites were there? How is it known? The little red dots. Okay. Who, who found those little red dots? So because of the transmission lines, there's a transmission line, there's a high-pressure gas main that goes through mm-hmm. the area, there's electricity easements, so all those infrastructure projects had, had surveys undertaken, so linear pedestrian survey, and people had registered those sites over the course of years. Okay. And in fact, if you look at the high pressure gas main, it does a funny U-shape through the development site. And that U-shape is attributable to Glenda Chalker, one of the Aboriginal elders, Coverage Barter elder, and she had the gas main moved around a high value site. Mm-hmm. She got the head of the gas company to move that, to conserve it. And she told me that story. She told me about how she'd contacted, I think, the general manager to have the gas main moved. And I talked to her about how we should look after that area. And indeed, because of her, I guess, activism and her care for that piece of country, we talked with Stockland, the park planning, we built 
the site she avoided in that whole area as a con into, a, into the development as a conservation nurse. That's <coughs> one of the sites that she conserved, I think it was in the late 90s, and it will be conserved today. And it means that that land will be there in 200, 400, and I hope in a thousand years' time, still intact, without anything having touched it. Was that the only uh, site she was interested in, though? I mean, was no, there she other was. Bits that she said, please make sure you can find evidence to conserve this, that, and whatever. She, she was interested in a lot of the sites, a lot of the areas. She was interested in the country, and she was interested in what it could tell us. And so, yes, but. So she, she would ideally have liked to see everything conserved. Mm -hmm. But the Aboriginal communities, they understand how things work and the practicalities, the fact they don't own this land. And I guess they appreciate it when people are able and the government does recognise that they do have a need to conserve and care for country. And I think the Aboriginal community, as a consequence of this process, has real buy-in to this. They've bought into the research, they've provided a lot of information, a lot of help in designing this research. In undertaking the physical works with us on site. Were they excited with what you found? <coughs> they were, were very, they, very they excited. Say, Please don't touch this bit. There's a duality, so they're very excited about right. what it can tell them, but they're then sad and saddened because of the impacts to it. But unfortunately, had we not undertaken the work we undertook, we wouldn't have any of this knowledge. Mm -hmm. This knowledge didn't exist beforehand. So the key to this now is to disseminate it through seminars such as this to other archaeologists. We're publishing a lot of the research. We're intending to publish it as a, some kind of a book and in peer-reviewed journals as well. And we work with the Department of Planning. It's established, and with the OEH, it's established new models for how to undertake this kind of work, how to undertake the excavation, new ideas of what to look for. Perhaps I'll do my archaeology in a slightly different way in this area. In my development area, maybe we'll find more of this evidence. Who will find new things. So we, we are applying this to a number of other excavations in and around Sydney and outside of Sydney and we hope to find similar kind of evidence and in fact in one area in western Sydney we have found further ovens already in another alluvial landscape. So. And there's going to be a school in there, in the area, and so we're going to build in a walking track that takes in the historical landscape and all of Cordo's former house, because that's going to be conserved as well. And we'll build a walking track through the riparian cord, and I'll probably tell you about the Aboriginal things and the traditional ceremonial area, probably tell you about that, and then you'll take you onto the hills and you can look at the view and you can go to the house. And, yeah, and the idea is then, perhaps with the, the new national curriculum, has specific requirements for heritage, for Aboriginal and historic heritage. The school can then use this data that we basically giving them and the information and they can interpret the, the, the information that's on their doorstep and take the kids on this walk and teach them about what exists in and around them in this Who area. Who decides the curtilage of the wetlands? Who decides it? Yeah. The creator of the landscape when they determine where the one in a hundred flood line is. It's defined, basically the development footprints are often defined by where flooding stops. But were they the use of The Aboriginal sites. The wetlands bits? Yeah, the ecologists have undertaken that kind of analysis and um, the wetlands are, yeah there's this conservation for the wetlands and they have to undertake appropriate remediation and management of those wetland areas so yeah so first thank you for the, the, the questions <laughs> uh, it was really fantastic you mentioned earlier about the, um, the study about the winter and the summer mm, i'm realizing uh, i didn't get to that are you suggesting that this area was only used in the summer that came there the time or not every year or when did they I would suggest based on just the light levels that it was fundamentally used in the summer months right. so it's a summertime activity and in Sydney in summer it rains a lot and in general and a long long term you know long term climatic aggregate it rains more in summer so you have more water and it's warmer so you can access you can use these lower landscapes these lower locations they don't have freezing fogs Combined with that, if you look at the life cycles of things like typha, when these grow in the wetlands, they're most abundant within the summer months. And typha is a spectacular plant because you have the rhizome, you can eat the rhizome if you process it appropriately, you can eat the, the, the shaft off it as well, and you can use the shaft for making manufacturing baskets and other materials. But then, if you look at the bulrush, I'm sure you've all seen it, they all have this fluffy white stuff around. Mm -hmm. So I'm told by the guys, the Darug guys, 
but that's often used as a kind of a material to put in babies' nappies. That's what they told me. They use it as a, a packing material so around. What did they have something like a baby's nappy? They use paper bark to create yeah. like carriers, and they use that as a packing. Mm -hmm. But underneath it, it, it forms the white stuff forms because you then see the the black, the brown flower on the top. Yeah. All those, all that, it's yellow and it's full of nectar. And so you can cook that and it's like a it's like a candy. You just eat it straight off the top. And that happens in summer. So basically these whole bulrushes, that, that creek, and basically it's just so prolific, it just grows like weed. It's a real problem for councils in terms of management now. You go to anywhere and you find I was at Balcombe Hills recently and I was my wife was horrified because I got in the creek and started pulling the stuff out of the creek. And she's like, What are you doing? Anyway, so it, it grows most prolifically in summer. So that food resource. It would be there in winter, but it's not growing in mass quantities in winter. You mentioned um, some of the early explorers or settlers mentioned about the cooking. The original land grant, uh, sorry, was it Cordo? Cordo. Uh, has any research been done about this? Do they have journals or did they mention anything about the Aboriginals on the land, the original settlers there? The research, we, the research we've done to date, and I could defer to some of my colleagues here, I don't believe they have written anything about the Aboriginal people. Not that we found. Not that we found. So, so without, without scouring every yeah. volume in the Mitchell Library, not that we found. I just wondered whether he, when he went there, mentioned anything about the, what was going on. I wish he had. Yeah. Well, we haven't. Yeah, been, that's what I'm If anyone can find it, please pass it on. The S Lord next door, was that Simeon Lord? Yeah, is that Simeon Lord? Yeah. Did he have, is there anything in any, he wrote? I have to be honest, I haven't looked, but um, again, that we, this is ongoing, we're at the minute, we're nearly at the end of collecting the scientific data, and then I'll start writing it up, so I need to go and look at some of these resources, so I will look at that. This is not really part of what you were doing, but I'm a, I'm a costume person, and apart from possum clothes, what did they have to keep him warm, because I mean, Sydney's not exactly the warmest place, I mean, the middle of it's you know, getting into winter now, and I'm certainly not be walking around stuff. Yeah. My understanding, I guess this is, and this is based from South Australia, mm -hmm. which is equally cold in winter in yeah. the Adelaide region, yeah. is that they were, they were very clever and knowledgeable in manufacturing clothing and cloaks. Yeah. They would take kangaroo and possum skins, yeah. they could cure them, they could sew them, they would create very, very warm clothes, because obviously, yes, they weren't walking around naked. Yeah, Sydney, people, Sydney people described as coping themselves Hello. And the fact that the top of the pants. Oh, yeah. No, because I've never seen anything about it. And of course, any pictures you see, they usually got nothing on. Or, mm. you know, and you just heard about the possum coats. And mm. that's about all I've ever heard of. So. Yeah. At least it got rid of those possums. <laughs> you mentioned the stone tools were not from the local area. Yeah. Where were they from? So we've asked Beth to have a look at the sources of, so of, of stone. So. In terms of um, where they were from, I'll see if I can. We know different stone come from different areas. The Charles Sydney, she has no idea where it comes from. It doesn't come from Sydney. It's just not found here. So that's outside. This is a rather smaller figure, but Silkrete is known to come from about 10k away. Oh. The source is Silkrete up here towards Plumpton Ridge. Mm -hmm. The source is Silkrete in the Holsworthy military area now. Okay. So Silkrete's 10k northwest, southeast. Is cobbles of silkrete, particularly in the St. Mary's gravels. Quartz can come from alluvial gravels. We haven't found any sources of alluvial quartz within East Lappington. It could be interbedding of alluvial quartz, the quaternary alluvium, just to the north or the south. I'm not able to find that out because I just can't walk around on people's land randomly. But Beth knows that there are sources about five or six kilometres in a variety of different directions. The Mudstone, I just call it mudstone for simplicity, we won't go into the naming of that. That comes from further afield again, that's perhaps 15, 20 kilometres away. So at an absolute minimum, the stone's coming from six kilometres, a lot of it's coming from ten, a lot of it's coming from further away. They got that by trading or...? Oh, now we're getting some really good questions. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, because I know they did trade things, didn't they? It depends, I would suggest it depends on what time point you're looking at. Yeah. So. In the last 1,000 years, I'm suggesting there's a mass change in Aboriginal economy. And the economy changes because you possibly have more people living in the landscape. Let's just assume that's a hypothesis. Greater 
So you have a greater density of people. If you have more people, you end up tied more to land, to particular land areas. Mm. And if you're tied more to particular land areas, you start to own and have more fixed boundaries in and around your own tribal zone, your clan area. Mm. And so what you start doing is controlling and owning the resources within your area. So one resource might be owned by family or person one, one resource by family or person two, and you get what's called social closure. And so I believe that in the last 1,000 years, social closure triggers the ownership of resources and therefore the need to trade more resources, and that's why you see different changes in stone technology. We're told by the stone artifact analysts in the last 1,000 years, backed artifacts stopped being made. Why did they abandon this entire technology they've used for intensively for four to 5,000 years and probably since 9,000 BP? Why did they stop fundamentally stop doing it in the last 1,000 years and move to quartz and bipolar reduction of quartz material? Something has to trigger that. So in the last 1,000 years, you end up with social closure, defined boundaries, the need to trade and procure materials and resources. And you're not just trading material and resources. You trade you agree marriages, mm -hmm. you trade traditions and stories, you trade songs, you've probably all heard of the women's song lines that are very famous, they go all the way from the north to the south of this whole country. If you look at the physical trade, you have movement of stone axes all the way, there's a lady who's doing an honours thesis at Sydney Uni at the minute, she's looking at the sources of axes all up and down the coast, green stone axes, I believe they're green stone, through the Daryl's territory, and they move all over the place. These are high value objects, and people trade all of these different types of materials and intangible values with each other. And to trade, they have to meet. They have to meet at fixed locations. And so we don't know the boundary locations of people, but where we think they occur, I think you, let's call them super sites. You get these locations with huge amounts of archeological evidence. I excavated one at Marulam a couple of years ago. There's no reason for the archeology span that we found to be located in this area. We found densities of 2,000 stone artifacts in a meter square. That's really, really high. There was no reason for these things to be on these, in these locations. But all of a sudden in this landscape, this location where we believe four tribes met, you suddenly got this density of material. Perhaps East Lappington is another such a location. It's near the boundaries of some of these different groups. So perhaps all the people were coming from different directions, which explains why in area three versus area two versus area six, you have very different stone in different layers. So in some areas you have lots and lots of kind of quartz objects. In some areas you have lots of back blades being made. Perhaps it's like some kind of conference. They get together in one area and make back blades one day. In the other area they go over here and cook in one day. You, know, you can create all kinds of stories around it and they're all hypotheses waiting to be tested. So, yeah. Not yet. Yeah, uh, I might do. I'll probably compare it to the, like the domiciliary areas, and. Um, I really remember at Marula, and there was some, and maybe this is just because it was like personally quite interesting. Um, there was some very No, I think we should have a look at that. Yeah. I forgot about the banding at Maroon. Yeah, because so. I remember sitting with Wally and he was, he was, and we put this core back together that had all those pieces taken yeah. up that same thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we should have a look at it, so. Were those red and white ones, was it the stone or was, was it white clay on the top of the red? It was part of it, it was the stone. So it looks like it's a stone, but it just has multiple so colors in it. Oh, yeah. And it looks like they then created the core they prepared a core to then be able to strike okay. flakes off it. Yeah, that then they can then manufacture the backed artifacts that have that colouring, distinct colouring top and bottom. I, if you find one, you can say, oh, it's just coincidental. But the fact we then, I think we found seven of them in total in that one trench, it starts to become not coincidental, yeah. particularly when you have the same proportion of red and white on each one. And when you ally that with other, with information you're told and instructed on from other people in different parts of the country about what colours can mean and how they're created and what they're used for. You can't ever say in Sydney, yes, this is what they're for, but you can start creating some, you know, some stories and some hypothesis around it. There was cooking 
They get washed. Yeah. There's a number of reasons. Archaeologically, say in southeast Australia, you don't often find a lot of faunal remains outside of middens. Mm. So in midden sites, you'll find shell and bones <coughs> and stone and carbon. But on in these kind of camping areas, particularly in Sydney, let's just talk about Sydney. In Sydney, you, you don't find a lot of bone. There's, there's no burials. I think Sydney has a total of something like 40 registered Aboriginal burials across the whole of Sydney. If we go to Adelaide and just look at the museums, or the South Australian Museum's record, they've got 2,000 registered burials in Adelaide. Why is that? You start to have to look at the alluvial context and the burial context of Sydney versus somewhere like Adelaide. Adelaide's an alluvial floodplain. There's opportunity to create a deep burial context and burial grounds. In Sydney, the burials that are found are found in small, either in shelter sites or in sandy context where there is sand, our sand body. So Kernel, for instance, has a lot of burial evidence. You then have to look at the geomorphology and the soil profiles, so the diagenetic profiles that result in the uh, retention of bone material. So if we flip to the historical side, and I was looking at the, city of, the old Sydney burial ground, they're 200 years old. There's pretty much nothing left of the skeletal material, and it's only 200 years old. The soils are very either acidic or alkaline. They just do not conserve bone. They're highly fluvial. The water just moves through them. It just decays the bone. So we just do not get the context. And then coupled with the fact, we, there's nothing written about how Aboriginal people buried people in Sydney. One theory is perhaps they buried them in some kind of mound. Because on most of Sydney soil, so out in Western Sydney, is pick any suburb you want, you can't just go along and dig a decent sized grave because you only have 30 centimetres, 300 mil of topsoil, and then you into that clay. If you try digging that clay, you can't dig it. You can't even dig it with a mattock, let alone with a, you know, with a digging stick or something. So they couldn't, create, they couldn't dig any depth of burial chamber. So therefore, you have to place it in the topsoil, and perhaps they made mounds, and there were burial locations. And then the, the suggestion is that because there were so many Europeans coming in, they saw these things and they just destroyed them. They just took them apart. And because Sydney has so been intensely occupied for so long, Perhaps all the burials were just, just removed by early farmers and early settlers. Oh, we don't want these things on our land. You know, let's, let's remove them. So we very rarely, that's, that's, that's a geomorphological explanation. The second reason is that bones, and particularly bones, animal bones, that you have eaten as an Aboriginal person can be used for magic. So if you want to undertake magic against someone for whatever level, one of the ways of doing it, and this is very general, but one of the ways of doing it is, is obtaining bone from a meal that someone has eaten. And you would then take it to a magic man who would undertake a ceremony and then give it back to you. And then you could do things with that bone to inflict whatever you want, a certain thing on that person. So people were often very, very careful in disposing of bone from the meals and the refuse that they ate. So, yeah. so there's, there's a kind of tradition of bone disposal as well. So in South Australia, when we're looking at the mound sites, you do get bone in those mounds, but it's not a lot. So in those mounds that have burials cut into them, they have ovens in them, they have clay balls, they have heaps of carbon, shell, you do get bone, yes, but you don't get the quantity you'd expect, perhaps for that same reason. Okie dokie. Okay, I think, um, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.